Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, welcome to Asia Tech Podcast. My name is Graham Brown. Today, our mission is to understand the Chinese market and the Chinese customer a little bit better. And what better way of doing that than going to Shanghai, one of the, the biggest cities in China, if not Asia in particular, and talking to a man from France. I'm not being trite. My point is that often the best way to understand a market is to come from the outside. So joining us today for ATP Stories is an entrepreneur who spent the last 20 years of his career coming from the outside, so to speak, Gregory Prudhomme. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Graham. It's good to have you here. Now, as I teed you up there, you're from France, from Lyon originally, and you are in Shanghai now, there's a long story there, which I want to get into, because I think it's kind of important in terms of what you do, especially at your current gig. So you are the founder of Next Step Services. Give us a summary first about what it is that you do at Next Step Services and what the problem is that you're trying to solve there is. And then what we do is we'll work backwards and find out how you got there. Sure. Um, basically, what I'm trying to, to do always in, in China since I arrived as to help entrepreneurs when they are starting in China. And next step is really this company that um, I created a few years ago, actually, uh, to help them with different phases of their steps in China. So the first thing is to understand the market, to understand where, uh, for example, if they are selling a product or services, they have to understand how to reach out to the right market, the right customers, understand also um, who are the competitors, how does it work, because you have competition here with a Chinese locals company, of course, but you also have all the biggest players in the world that are all looking at China and already here. Um, and that's one thing that we do. So it's really around the, the consulting and understanding the market. And the other step, actually, is uh, something that is, has been growing very, very fast for the past uh, year, year and a half, which is about content marketing, because... Um, all these clients, when they understand the market and we told them, okay, your customers are here and there and that's how they look and that's what they are willing to buy. We also realized before that uh, there was no way for them to actually engage and activate everything that we told them. Mm -hmm. So by building a lot of content all the time, we also start to have clients that say, oh, actually, you understand my business. You know who I should be talking to. And you have the whole structure to create content for me. And this is where we started to add this kind of services. And this is the fastest uh, part of my business that is growing, like mainly because of WeChat. And I think we're going to talk a lot about that mm. um, soon. Exactly. Okay, good. So what are the kind of companies that come to you? Are they companies moving into the Chinese market for the first time? What kind of level of knowledge do they have? about china are they you know well educated about china completely new what, what are you finding um so i've been helping these kind of companies to enter the market for the past 12 years so i've seen very different kind of uh, of companies mm -hmm. recently i would say that um there are two types of uh, companies reaching out to me one is indeed companies that are pretty let's say medium size or small size that are coming from europe or from the u.s um, and they have very little understanding. They know that you have all these big players, uh, all these guys that we've heard about it all the time, Alibaba, Tencent, they heard about the, all these big companies, but it's so difficult to have actually very clean and straightforward information about those companies when you are not in China, uh, because there is very little understanding by most of the media outside of Asia in, in general. Mm -hmm. um, and other companies also, and this is something that is, uh, also very new to me. I, I never really expect that. Companies that have been here in China for quite some time, but they realized that they were, they were missing the train. They were just passing next to everything that was happening, especially regarding the, the communication, the media, the WeChat, uh, online um, um, content, advertising, blogging. And they were realizing that uh, they were doing it wrong for, for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and those clients now are, are trying to say, okay, we want to talk to the customers. Those are the customers. How should we do it? And that's where they come to us. We build their editorial line, for example. And we then going to manage all their content and publication. And also trying to explain to them how to make the most of tools that like Weibo, WeChat, and all these uh, platforms that you have here in China. Okay. 
Good. Well, let, let's go into that Chinese market because I think that's the the aim of the game with today's um, story is really to find out mm-hmm. a bit more about China. And we have a lot of expectations and images of what China is and what it isn't from the outside. And as you say, rightly, it's very difficult to understand it until you get on the inside. If I was French mm-hmm. now, moving from anywhere in France or for that matter, anywhere, you know, in the world outside of China, particularly outside of Asia, maybe they have less access to information. And I moved to Shanghai today in 2017. Mm -hmm. What would surprise me? Can you name thing, name one thing that would surprise me as somebody coming from what I would call a developed quote unquote market to China today? Yeah, I I think that uh, what is uh, really, really shocking to many people uh, and I have a little story around that as well. Um, it's the use of the smartphone here and the mobile payment. Uh, so everything that is linked to payment here in China is so advanced. It's, it's, uh, really, really shocking for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I, I was meeting with, uh, someone, uh, over the weekend that someone that used to be living in China for quite, quite some time, many, a few years. And he left one year ago to the US, came back for a business trip to Shanghai and haven't been there for, for a year. And we are in bar and he start realizing that everybody is using their mobile phone to buy beers at the bar. Mm. And he, he knows China, he knows how fast it can go, but he was really surprised on how fast these things became uh, the constant for everybody. So everybody is using the phone. I can spend a week with only my phone and no wallet and I can do everything I need. Do you uh, use and this is something yourself? that when... I, no, I don't have to use cash. My right. phone will do it all. Right, right. Can, you say you I don't have buy, to, but do you? I mean, just so so we can understand. I mean, when people talk about mobile payment, for example, mobile payment's been around yeah. a long time. And even you know, when you were in France in 1990s, right? It was yeah. there at, in the early telecoms day. But you're talking about mobile payment smartphones being, you know, the default, the, the normal rather than, oh, yes. it's cool. Yes. Hey, look, I can pay with my smartphone in the bar, right? Okay, but now go and try and do that at yeah. the shop around the corner, right? So for you on a day to day basis, you don't need any cash. Is that what you're saying? I don't need I don't need cash. I don't need cash and most of the people actually they now they don't even carry cash. Uh because you can really buy everything with your phone. You can get uh, a farmer that is selling watermelons uh, from the back of his trunk. Uh, at the bottom of your building and this guy will have a QR code and you will pay him directly using your, <laughs> your WeChat payment. Right. Gotcha. Uh, and this is, this is where now everything is like this. So the, the mobile phone and the QR code also, which is, I know, uh, not very used in Europe and in US, uh, uh, for a lot of people. Um, but here in China, if you don't have a QR code on an advertising, if you don't have a QR code on a product, if you don't have a QR code in, in, even on your business cards now, and this is like not having your the URL of your the domain name of your website, you know, the mm-hmm. URL of your website. If you don't have this, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. So when I have companies coming to China, the first thing they will do is downloading WeChat for their phone because they know that here when they're gonna arrive, people are gonna take their name cards, but they're also all gonna exchange the the WeChat account. Right. So like these people they can add them directly and follow up with them. So the WeChat account. However, for foreigners, when they come to China, they cannot have the mobile payments because you need to have a bank card that are based in China, like a, a Chinese bank card, mm-hmm. um, and you don't have other currency. So let's, those are the things that... Okay, let's, let's talk about WeChat because that, that's so important. It's such a big factor of the Chinese market, isn't it? And I think for people on the outside, when they hear WeChat, they assume what it used to be, which was what a chat service, which started out as and a messenger service, mm. right? And they assume yes. that it's kind of like WhatsApp or maybe it's like what people are familiar with, you know, in just in terms of text messaging, right? So, mm-hmm. but it's much more than that now. I mean, that's what we've got to kind of understand. So you kind of, I know you talked about the payments, you've got the, the WeChat payments mm-hmm. aspect of it, but what is WeChat for somebody coming from the outside? H- help us understand it. It's more than just chatting, right? What is it now? Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, a good way to explain WeChat, the basic features are something between WhatsApp and um, and maybe Facebook a little bit because you also have a wall where you can share 
the photos, you can share a link or whatever you read. So it's kind of the same thing that you have on the wall on Facebook mm -hmm. uh, where people will be able to like and comment, okay? Um, so those are the basic features that will everybody will have if you download WeChat right now, wherever you are in the world, this is what you will get. And then when you are in China, you have a lot more uh, possibilities because WeChat is a super app where they allow the system uh, for developers to create mini programs that are going to be set only working in WeChat. Mm -hmm. So inside, you, inside WeChat, you will have programs uh, also and, and software kind of uh, that you will be able to, to use only using WeChat and using all the information. So the payments, of course, but for example, I can pay my, my electricity bill directly. I can buy train ticket. I can buy flight tickets. I can share the bill if I go to the restaurant and I'm taking the bill and then I will share, I will split the, they, they call that actually GoDutch in the application and they will split the bill with my friends around the table. Um, so you have many functionality that are actually, when you think about it, they are all linked to the fact that there is a payment system. So mm. it's all about buying, purchasing, uh, sending cash from one another. So those are all the features that are very interesting. The geolocalization also is very good. Something that I'm, uh, I'm missing usually when I travel, for example, where, uh, you can really see where people are and you can, uh, when you are meeting with someone in a, in a big place, you don't know where to find them. You can see exactly where people are on the map and you can join them directly. So you have this geolocalization that is embedded also and, and you can share addresses very easily. So this is all embedded in, in WeChat and people are using this all the time. So for most people, or for some people even, that, you know, you could just use WeChat and, you know, the whole concept of the internet that lies on the outside, that may not be necessary. I, I wonder how people use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Is that sort of their experience of the internet, just WeChat? Yeah. So the one thing that is missing on WeChat is that there is some kind of a uh, search engine, uh, but it's not like, it's not very, very good so far. So... Everything that has been published somewhere on WeChat is technically accessible with a search engine intern as WeChat. So I'm not going to be looking for information really on WeChat. You, you need to have already the page that you are looking for. Because one thing that I didn't mention is that WeChat is used by individual, you and me, where we can be chatting, mm -hmm. like WhatsApp. But you would exactly have the same thing like on Facebook for fan pages where you can have your page uh, in a company page, a company account, where we call that subscription or service account, where the company are going to create their own uh, WeChat content, and they will be able to push publication articles on a regular basis. And for example, this is where my company help a lot of uh, my clients by doing this. We create all their contents, and we will use WeChat to publish it. This content is published and edited Within WeChat, it's not online. It's not on mm. on on the internet. You know, it's it's not on the internet with a, a page that you can find by googling something. You know, uh, it's really within WeChat. Okay. So, whereas what we're used to, let's say, for example, in Europe or the US, America, you have a brand, any kind of established brand. They the default is that they have a web page. And then only recently they've started getting Facebook fan pages. And in many cases, the Facebook fan pages is pretty, well, static. Not much happens there. You know, people like stuff. They post a little bit yeah. of stuff. But there's no real interaction, is there, going on apart from some sort of basic yeah. liking. But with WeChat, what you're saying, so I can understand, is that the the WeChat aspect comes first. And I guess, you know, you may have brands or companies that don't even have a website because they can exist purely on WeChat. Is that the case? Exactly, because, for example, one of, I'm, I'm working for a big uh, uh, French medical company. It's a little bit like Johnson & Johnson, let's say. Uh, and um, so for them, their strategy is that they created a mini website that is only working on WeChat, mm -hmm. and we publish content only for their WeChat. So they are not even building a website. They have a company website somewhere because this company is, is everywhere around the world. Um, but actually, right now, they are investing only on targeting their WeChat followers. Mm -hmm. So they are investing a lot of money and resources and everything, but only using WeChat. For example, one of the other projects that we do for the Milu, which is a guidebook for French-speaking family when they arrive to, to China, we do have a website because we say, okay, 
let's put that on a website at some point since we are creating the content we're just copy pasting on the a WordPress website let's say but we are uh, focusing on the WeChat we are working every week on, on, on developing the WeChat content actually it's not really for the website not mm-hmm. even on Facebook actually it's really for the WeChat because we know that the first thing that people will do when they will arrive to China is going on WeChat uh, they will get all the information on WeChat there was someone there was someone telling me for example that they don't even read newsletter because most of the the information they get is directly on their mobile phone in their pocket mm. on WeChat. So they don't really have to go to their emails and things like this. I know some companies also, they almost drop their emails internally. They only use groups because you can create groups the same way you can do that in in WhatsApp, for example. So uh, chat group. Yeah. And they have a chat group for the marketing team, chat group for the whole team, chat group for... And that's how they exchange uh, everything. Instead of having Slack, uh, they will use this kind of vertical conversation by groups, same thing. And they will exchange PDF file documents internally. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, that's what a lot of companies coming from the outside are not prepared for, are they? They're not prepared for that kind of ecosystem. And they, they're used to having the many, many different channels in a way. And now you've got like this one yeah. channel with it, or maybe even many channels within one channel, but one platform, so to speak. Okay, so let's um, yeah. let's come back to that because I think that's a really interesting conversation. I think we can come back to that as well. I want to sort of, before we do, just put this into context as well because your story, I think, is interesting and it helps us understand if we then go back and look at the Chinese market again. So let's sort of step outside of the Chinese market first and talk about you, Gregory, and how you got there in the first place because we talked about it earlier that obviously you're from France, you're from Lyon in France, and mm-hmm. you somehow ended up in Shanghai in China. And Shanghai, compared to Lyon, I mean, population, I don't know the population of Lyon, but Shanghai is what, 24 million? So, you know, the, the, the yeah. exactly. And Lyon's nowhere near that, is it? I'm not sure. It's not sort of a, a major city by comparison, is it? So, no, Lyon, I, th- I, I think that Lyon doesn't even have a million or maybe it's a big, <laughs> it's a big city and every city, maybe a million. Um, so what happened is that um, um, I studied, so I, I started to, I was always interested by history, actually, and uh, general history actually lead me, I had some, uh, it, it, for me it was easy to learn languages uh, at that time, and I said, okay, uh, there was a university in Lyon that was pretty, in 1998, um, and uh, I realized that, okay, China, 5,000 years of history should keep me busy a little bit. All right, let, let's do Chinese. Yep. But you have to think that Chinese at that time was uh, very not popular because there was, I think, you do speak Japanese. Back then, there was maybe 400 people studying Japanese. Mm. Uh, and we in Chinese, we were maybe not even 20 people. So it was not popular. People were not looking at this. And for me, I went there not really for the language, but really for the history side of it. So I studied civilization, uh, Chinese civilization for three years. Um, then I switched to something that, uh, that's also at that time that I started coming to China for like summer school, summer camp. I was coming here to Beijing, uh, and, and I took advantage on the fact that my Chinese was going well. I was speaking already and I started to do little work, little, uh, I did sourcing. I, uh, I took groups around China. I did some trading, you know, like very, like everything that I could do instead of working in a, in a, in a mm. restaurant in France, uh, I was just doing this kind of little business uh, here in China. My life also was cheaper. Back then, China was cheaper than France. Now nah, it's getting complicated. Shanghai mm. is super expensive. Uh, but back then, spending two months in China was cheaper than spending two months in, in France, definitely. Mm. And that's how I started. And uh, I, I, I started to... Stop you there. I want to back up a little bit. Just put this into context. What, what year was it when you actually started your studies in China? 1998. So that's when I started to, yeah, in, to study Chinese. I came to China the very first time in 2000, summer 2000. Went to Beijing for two months. Uh, and from there, I think from 2000 to 2005, I came almost every year or every other year uh, for the summers. I was spending a lot of time here in China doing everything that I could do, basically. Mm-hmm. And, and um and in 2005, I, I moved to Hong Kong because I went back to school to do something a bit better with my Chinese instead of just doing uh, civilization and, and linguistic, 
I didn't want to become a teacher. I didn't want to become an interpreter or whatever. So I said, I need to add something more business to this. So I went and follow some kind of um, uh, business program in, in, in France. And I applied for an exchange uh, year uh, to Hong Kong. And, and because my Chinese was already good, I've been to Hong Kong many, many times. Uh, I got selected and I spent one year, a little bit less than a year in Hong Kong in, the, in university. And from them, I, I never went back. Actually, from Hong Kong, uh, I had the opportunity to, to move to Shanghai because a consulting firm, a Chinese consulting firm uh, here, they were saying, oh, we, we are not reaching out to foreigners. We are only working with Taiwanese, Korean and Japanese. And, and maybe you could be interested on, on developing this. And he was already consulting on helping companies to come to China. And, and what we did actually was to, they helped me on building, on setting up my own company. And every time that I was selling a services, I was outsourcing it to them, kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, after a little bit, I also realized one thing that in China, um, I didn't have any network. I didn't have what we call here in China, guanxi, which are relationship. Uh, if you don't have a relationship, if you don't have network here in China, you cannot really do anything. So you really need to build your own community. And that's exactly what I started to do. I, I started to, to create uh, events with a, uh, with a friend. We started to do networking events. So that was back in 2006. Uh, we started to create this kind of networking events every other Tuesday. We started to work on conferences and roundtable uh, with some chambers of commerce uh, here based in Shanghai. What kind of networking and that events was the best were way for us to, What kind of events were It was really for entrepreneurs. For foreign entrepreneurs in Shanghai? It was for entrepreneurs. Yeah, for foreign no, entrepreneurs, for, for Chinese. No, it was for everybody. Uh, uh-huh. For everybody. So it was for uh, everybody who feel like uh, they wanted to meet other entrepreneurs. They were like, what we were calling that, it was Next Step Tuesdays for like-minded entrepreneurs. And and it was a good way for us to have foreigners from all around the world, but also local Chinese that were speaking a bit of English and they were interested on on talking to other foreigners. Yeah. Um, back then, also the te- the tech scene was very little in in China. It was not there yet, but you started to have a lot of entrepreneurs because the barrier here is very low. When you want to start a business in China, actually, it's it's pretty easy, and and it was also cheaper to start it in China back then than uh, than in other countries. So you had a lot of uh, people that were coming here in China with a good idea in mind and and uh, just a little bit of cash. And they were starting here in China. It was easy to find some people to recruit, to hire, to put a company together and get started. But the problem is everybody was lacking of uh, network and relationship. So those kind of events that we run for three years uh, actually help a lot of people on building their own network for clients, but also for service providers, um, any kind of people that they will need. Right. So... You started out doing these networking events in 2006, and obviously this yes. is this is over 10 years later. You saw a group of people coming to China back in 2006, and you you had been there before them, obviously, and you got your foothold in in Hong Kong, and you had also come quite regularly yeah. to China. What's the yeah. kind of? Is there any kind of difference between the people that were there in 2006 and the kind of people showing up in Shanghai today in 2017? Well, there is a one big thing. Is 2006 uh, doesn't mean so much to a lot of people, but 2006 here it was very important because the 2008 were the Olympic Games in Beijing and 2010 the World Expo. So in 2006, all the companies that wanted to take advantage of all these international events happening to China, they were exactly coming at that time. They said, there is something happening. We better be there when it's going to mm. all start. And and that's why 2006, 2007, they were very, very interesting years because that's when most of the companies came. I will always say that for me, the best years in of Shanghai, they were between 2005, let's say, and 2012. Those are, or 2010 even, they were great years. Like you had a, a little ideas, Bit of cash and a bit of tenacity, and you can you can do something in Shanghai. That was, I'm not going to say easy, but that was mm. easier, definitely easier. The difference with the people that are coming now, I think that people now are a little bit advent, a little bit less adventurous than they were before. Before you really had guys coming with a backpack and they say, okay, let's do it. It's a little bit like I did actually. Uh, now you have less people like this because China is more complicated. Again, it's also more expensive, so you have people that are more prepared to come here. 
Uh, I think on the entrepreneur, entrepreneur scene, you have a, a different mindset also before people were coming uh, and arriving with an idea. Now they come here because of a job or they arrive mm-hmm. with a job. Uh, and then later on, they will quit their job and start their own thing. Because also the immigration regulation here is very complicated. So you really need to have to get a visa and to be able to to have a resident permit here in, in China is also uh, a bit tricky. So you really need to have a, something going on, like a work going on, you know. Mm. So and before it was easier as well. You were arriving like this and you can get a visa simply and, and start to create something without creating values. But now in China, if you don't create value, if you don't have a company that make money, um, they are not going to be so so welcoming this time. Okay, really interesting in that sort of development that you say that you know when you moved to Shanghai originally, it was a lot more open in the sense that there was more opportunity, as was any city that would yeah. be in that sort of stage of development. And you came there, and now you're in a stage where you're you're quite well established in China and Shanghai and you are helping yeah. people get into this market and particularly people coming from the outside. How do you feel about the fact that you're not Chinese in this market and you never will be Chinese, obviously? Um, obviously, you have gone to great lengths to learn the language and you inst- beyond that, you have studied the culture and the literature mm-hmm. and, and the history and so on. So you, you know it more than anybody else, but you're not Chinese. And somebody coming mm-hmm. to that market would say, well, how is a French guy going to help me understand the Chinese customer? I need a Chinese customer. Mm-hmm guy to do that job somebody ideally who speaks really good english or french maybe right so how do you feel about that do you think that's a kind of a false way of looking at the market is that a wrong way of doing it and how do you feel about the fact that as i said that you know you're in this business trying to help people understand chinese customers and you're not chinese Mm. yourself Uh, i think one of the this is a good question i think this is something that always comes to me when i'm pitching my services uh, but the problem is that when you spend some time here in China, you will also understand that talking to Chinese, even if they speak great English, there is a big culture difference. It's, there is a gap here. And, and, and there are a lot of people making a lot of money in China working on, on, on cross-cultural situation mm-hmm. because it's not so easy to actually fill this gap. And, and me being in between, actually, and of course, I'm not working by myself. I have a, a team, and most of my team that are based in Shanghai uh, are, of course, uh, Chinese, Shanghainese, and, and, and they have been working with me for many years. And those people, they are also like me. They speak several languages, so they, have, they are Chinese, but they understand uh, they speak French, and they have been spending many years in France. Some others speak very good English, and they, work in, uh, they have been working in some other countries. And they also understand understand the gap as well. So me, my, thing, my, my job is to actually make sure that when the client, the foreign client is going uh, gonna to pass a message to me, I will be able to also interpret it and translate it to be able to pass it to my team so that in order that everybody understand and that the clients manage to express his needs and his, his, I don't know, his situation to me with his own words and his cultural references and everything, I will be able to pass that to the Chinese side and the Chinese, my team, they will also understand me and they understand the client and we'll be able to under, to pass it to a real Chinese, 100% Chinese situation, for example. So the cultural gap, I think, here in China, things are changing for one reason also between what happened 10 years ago and now is that a lot of the Chinese that you will be meeting now, especially in Shanghai, they all had the chance to um, to travel, uh, to study abroad for a lot of them. They have a great level of English. Uh, and, and this is what you will find now. When I arrived to have people that were speaking English, actually, most of the companies that were run by people, by people that were 50 years old and more, mm. uh, those guys, they didn't understand English. Most of them never really traveled either. So back then it was very, very complicated for them to understand. Like buying consulting, this is something that was very complicated also for, for Chinese companies to understand what a consultant was because actually they just do things. They, they don't really get advice. They call their friends for advice and consulting. Yeah. You know, they, they don't buy services from someone. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that, yes, go ahead. No, it's fine. Okay. Very interesting. And I think that, you know, what you're saying is that, um, 
you know, in, in a way, being in the situation that you're in, um, you know, it's not a disadvantage doing what you're doing. And I guess for companies coming from the outside, you really are a bridge between those outside markets and China. So you, you have a good understanding of both what the, the local Chinese want and also yeah. these foreign companies want. And obviously that gap's decreasing over time, as you say. And that's helping things in a way because, you know, that may make things easier for the communications on all sides. And I think the situation you're in is a real advantage as well, sometimes not being part of a market in the sense, you know, in terms of identity um, is a real mm-hmm. advantage because you you see things which people take for granted, maybe, the, the local Chinese. I mean, if you were to go back to France, you would see it differently, right, from how you were seeing France when you were growing up. Because now you've seen things, right? Now you know what's real mm-hmm. and what's not real. And in a way, that's the kind of the role that you have. You know, even though you say sort of the gap, you know, some people don't like living mm-hmm. in the gap, do they? Because it's uncomfortable. They feel like, oh, you know, I want to be French in France, right? But you're mm-hmm. in that gap in China. And I think that's a real position of advantage to play with, you know. And some people don't like it. But obviously, that's a, a position in which you thrive, right? So... I think that's, you know, interesting yeah. that you can enjoy that responsibility as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, most of the people that are coming to China, they all, I mean, to be very honest, I think people don't come to China for the weather, right, or for the beach or whatever. They come here to, to work, make money, and, and actually get a business going on And because China is a huge opportunity. The problem is that either... You arrive 10 years ago like I did and you kind of follow what was happening and you learn along the way. And that's uh, probably what I did and many other people also. Um, and you learn the language and you get used to it and you are here with the first version of WeChat and, and, and all these things. And so you, you learn from that. But when you arrive now and you are dropped here in China, uh, you don't have time anymore because China is so demanding. It, the market is, is really, really fierce. Um, if you are here to start a business or you are here to open the branch of your company or whatever here in China, you really have to get to 200 percent because nobody is waiting for you. Mm. So in this case, you need help and you need people that are going to help you on understanding the, the technology, understanding the, the team. Also, like how do you communicate with your team? How do you manage a Chinese team? You don't do it the same way that you will manage a, a team of American people or, or French. You know, it's very different. Um, and even more complicated when it's a mixed team. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to a, to a company right now. It's a tech uh, startup, uh, and they grew from six people to over 50 people in three months, something like this. And they have many, many problems because they have a team that is very mixed and the message are not going through the same way. So they have very different way on, on managing the whole team and, uh, and making everybody comfortable in this kind of team. Very complicated. So again, that's why cross-cultural is something very complicated in China. This is something that uh, is working very well. What are the kind of mistakes that companies make when they come into China now? Now you, you mentioned some of them already, but what are the repeat mistakes that yeah. people make when they get into Shanghai as an example? I think that a lot of people, they will trust easily. They will uh, trust uh, the first person that was nice and took them to lunch and, and speak a bit of English. And, and I saw so many companies trusting the first person they met. It, it's a little bit like a, it's a, uh, like a, a life jacket, this person. So they will grab this guy as soon as they arrive to China. Mm. Uh, and it's, and he's, they're going to follow everything. And after a few months, a few years, they will realize that okay maybe he was nice but he was not the the one he was not the perfect one you know so a lot of people made this kind of mistake i also think that um a lot of people a lot of companies that i saw especially when we are talking about products they believe that they have been selling their product in their market in a way and that they should not adapt to the local market uh and and if they don't make any change in the way they communicate the the positioning of the product or even sometimes if we are if we are talking about food product the recipes of the product the Chinese consumer are not going to be so keen on accepting and welcoming this kind of product. And and you do still have some companies that they believe, no, we are not going to change anything that the way we are selling it and, and that's it. But here in China, it, it doesn't really work that way. So you really have to adapt to, to the market. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Excellent. And one of the, just sort of finishing up, I'm really fascinated by this 
the Milu project, which you've uh, already mm-hmm. mentioned, which is effectively a digital yeah. guidebook for French families coming to China. So exactly. is that a thing now? Do you, you see French families coming to China? I mean, you know, is, is it something that's increasing? What's driving it? Tell us a little bit about that. What's going on? Yeah. So I think that with the French, so first the French community here in Shanghai, we are like uh, or a little bit over 25,000 people that are registered. Uh, so this is not counting the students and, and of course the tourists or people on short term visa. But 25,000 make uh, the French community the number one European community in China, mm. uh, in Shanghai, sorry. So uh, before the German, before the German, many years ago, German were number one because there is a huge need of industry and and China always have been a big friend of of, uh, of uh, Germans, so it always have been very well. But now that uh, uh, Shanghai is more and more about, um, let's say, uh, services, tourism, uh, everything that is linked to food and beverage, and here there is a lot of uh, uh, French coming in, and also on, on the tech scene because uh, a lot of startups are now the French tech startup is very big. And same thing in China, we, we have a, a lot of uh, startups that are coming from Europe, from France, or even starting from scratch here, actually, a lot of projects. And this is something that I run and I help a lot also. So the families are coming here because uh, some people, they are following a job uh, most of the time. We know how it could have been very difficult in Europe for some of the uh, for some of the companies. So moving to China is actually a, a, sometimes a great move, uh, like an expatriate. Mm-hmm. I think that the expatriate package, as we know it, uh, is disappearing because China is too expensive. So And you have so many people on the market that you can recruit foreigners locally. You don't really have to go through an expat package anymore. And, and French are these kind of people also that uh, they move and travel together with the family. So for example... Uh, the difference with Chinese, a Chinese will have no problem on leaving his family to Shanghai and going mm. to work in Beijing for three years. No problem. Uh, French, they don't do that. So they come all together, which also bring other problems. Is how do you send a French to a factory that is uh, six hours from Shanghai? If there is no school for the kids, if there is no doctors, if there is no, nothing, this is also very complicated. Mm-hmm. So the guidebook that we created is really about that. At the beginning, it was really a book, a paper version, uh, that was meant to help uh, French families when they were arriving here with how do you open a bank account, how do you register to the police, uh, how do you uh, open a, a phone line, for example. So really, uh, like, how do you get started in China? You know, how do you find an apartment? Uh, these kind of things. And, and slowly, um, uh, for many years, I was uh, talking to the, the creator, uh, Manuel Ramos of uh, Milun, and we were talking about the digital version of it. And many years ago, I was saying, oh, we should go for an app, an application. This, this is the way to go and everything. And we really left this idea on the side for many years. But then WeChat exploded. So WeChat was everywhere. So we said, okay, now... This is actually so much cheaper to do something on WeChat than creating an application. And, um, and actually people don't create the application anymore. You just, mm-hmm. you just do something on WeChat. Uh, and, and that's what we did. So we created the, we still have the paper version because some family, we are talking to maybe, a, uh, older generation sometimes. So they like to have the paper version where we have very great cartoons for, to illustrate the whole thing. And we have this uh, WeChat version where we push, uh, let's say, articles, updates, new regulation every Mondays. Those articles, uh, a lot of them are actually then taken by the consulate that will also reshare them directly. And that's how we are reaching out to a lot of people that are not yet in China, but they are starting to learn, prepare their, their uh, expatriation from France or from other countries. And the first thing they will do is they usually go on the website of the embassy or the consulate. They will download WeChat. They will find about the Milo. And, and that's how uh, we get to them very early, actually. The acquisition yeah. is very early. So if you're a French speaker, and I know we have French speakers um, listening to this program, that's something that you should definitely check out if you're thinking about moving to China or you are moving to China. We'll yeah. put the details in the show notes. Hey, Gregory, something you can tell me about just as we finish up. And very curious about this because... When Shanghai first became a thing, and we're sort of going, you know, 10 years or so back, like when you first moved there and people started talking about Shanghai on the, the international scene, and obviously that was in the run-up to Beijing 2008 and so on, 
you know, when that became a thing, one of the th- stories that was kind of repeated a lot in the media, and, and I don't know if this is true or not, and I'd like to hear your perspective because A, you know Shanghai, and B, you're French. It was that the local Shanghainese, especially the the young, sort of upwardly mobile, you know, when drinking red wine, they would mix it with Coke. Was that true or not? Was that just kind of one of those media things about China? Okay, maybe it happened once or twice. Or was that a real thing back then? No, yeah, this is true. It, uh, it's true. But, uh, you know, like the same way that uh, German, Austrian are mixing white wine sometimes with uh, mineral water or yeah. with Sprite uh, to, to make this kind of fresh drinks. Here in China, they had the, they had the same situation. But one thing that I learned very, very recently is, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, this company Pernod Ricard. It's a yeah, big company course, that yeah. produces a lot of uh, drinks okay. and everything. So they came up the idea, they came up with the idea of mixing whiskey with green tea because mm. Chinese, they love green tea. And, and thus are the guy and, and they created the idea, they marketed it. And that became a real thing. Like to have a, when you were ordering a bottle of whiskey in a club, of course, they will always bring you green tea. There was no Coke. There was no other thing. It was green tea with a uh, whiskey. And that was the thing. So yes, wine with, uh, I saw wine with, uh, Coke. Uh, this I saw it in a in a dinner many years ago. Now you will not do that anymore. I right. think that uh, a lot of, especially in Shanghai, people they 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 have learned and, and they have seen other things, so they they try to not do that. But I'm sure that in some part of China, you can still have Coke with your right. wine for sure. <laughs> as a, as a as a Francais, would you? Do that, would that be something that you could consider doing? I know, obviously, with your rich culture of wine, would you mix Coke with it in China? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, never. It's impossible. <laughs> it's exactly. impossible. Already, like here in China, you find wine in cans, and that's something weird for a lot of French, yeah. where you can go to the, the 7-Eleven downstairs and you get a can of Chardonnay. Uh, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it kind of makes sense as well. I mean, and I, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, obviously the, the wine industry in France has a long tradition and there was a lot of resistance at the mm-hmm. early stages of putting screw tops on the wine bottles, right? But in places like Asia, mm-hmm. you see that everywhere and it makes sense, right? It, you know, and yeah, that's the whole kind of attitude is, well, we don't need tradition if it doesn't work. I mean, take the tradition of the wine and everything, but the actual bottling, we can improve it and make it better. Agreed, agreed. And actually, I think the New World have done a lot of work. Even in, there was an article going around lately uh, that France has lost a little bit the the, the, the first uh, place as a wine importer to China and Chile, Australia, New Zealand, they are all taking over very easily. South Africa, hmm. um, because their labels are easier, the cork also, the, the screwing or, or, or the cork that they have is much easier as well. Uh, they are more flexible So than the wine where f- in France we are so traditional and, and, and strict about this that we don't adapt necessarily to the market. Some companies make a lot. Of, again, we are always going back to the, what I was saying earlier. Like If you don't adapt to the market, exactly. at some point someone will. Eh? That's a great lesson as well. So thank you so much. That's Gregory Prudhomme, everybody, founder of Next Step Services. Really enjoyed you having you on the show today, Gregory, and sharing your insights into the Chinese markets and also particularly Shanghai. And since you've been there such a long time now in the grand scheme of things, Mm. how things have developed and how fast that market has moved. There's a lot, obviously, more to talk about when it comes to China and Shanghai. So it'd be great to do a part two at some point in the future and learn a bit about what's changing because even six months in Shanghai is a long time, right? As you said, like your friend who went away for a year and came back and things had changed radically when it came to payments and so on. But Gregory, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before I let you go, please share with us a link or links so people can find out more about you and what you do. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So um, uh, the easiest way to to find me will be on Next Step Hub. So it's uh, Next Step in one word, hub h h u b dot com. Um, I think you will put everything on the on the page as well. Yep. This is the best way, and you can find me uh, on on everywhere by googling uh, Greg uh, Prudomo. You will find it uh, easily on Twitter and even on Facebook and everything. Um, that's the best way to find what I do. Excellent. We'll put all the details in the show notes. Gregory, thank you so much for today. Thanks a lot, Graham. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. 
Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.